Well, our next presenter here doesn't really need any introduction because she's been in many of these presentations. And, uh, she's shown great initiative in promoting monetary reform in her own venues, talking about people who do things. I ask her especially to do this presentation on what she's been doing. And uh, she's going to talk about her experience. So it's my pleasure to introduce Sue Peters, that you all know. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Um, tell me if I walk around too much, because I get nervous and I like to walk and I do all this stuff. Um, so, Jamie, who is Jamie? How do I get it up? Jamie, how do I get it up here? <laughs> yeah, it's in this. Uh, yeah, but it's not upstairs. <coughs> and, and how do I uh, all of it? That all of it. about um, how over the years I've built monetary reform in my community. Um, and I did it because I was learning the whole time I was teaching. And I was so enthused by this movement and the knowledge. Um, and you'll say, okay, so I'm going to do who am I? How did I discover monetary reform? What did I do next after I discovered it? And what have I been doing? So who am I? I'm a New Yorker. I live with two roommates. There they are, um, Andrea and Pam, on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. That's my, the, the window to my bedroom on uh, the side street. What street do you live on? Uh, West 98th Street, between Broadway and West End. And for many years, I worked on Wall Street for 30, actually 35 years. That was my career. I loved it. As a computer programmer analyst, and eventually, you know, you work yourself up after 35 years, I ended up designing business systems using computer programs for Wall Street firms. The last 15 years for a multinational bank, which we all know. <laughs> um, I got that job in the year 2000, working for my first bank, and I just have to say, I really needed a job for different reasons, but um, when I left the interview, a friend of mine called me, and she said, how did it go? I said, I think it went okay. And she said, what does the system do? I said, I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know what I, they, they eventually hired me, and I didn't know what I was stepping into. And I was stepping into the world of multinational banking. I didn't really know it. How did I discover monetary reform? In 2010, 
While watching a documentary movie, I learned that all private commercial banks create our money when they give a loan. I literally, I was shocked. It was 11 o'clock at night. I was working for this bank for the last 10 years. And this came across the screen. And what did I do? I asked myself first, this was the thought that always comes into my head. Why didn't I learn this in my school? How come I don't know anything about this? And then I looked around and I said, wow, private money. This explains the problems I see. Because I, I could never really understand what was going on with the world around me, with all the problems. But when I learned about debt money, I can understand the concentration of wealth, the unemployment, the war, the poverty, the debt. It made sense to me. So what did I do next? The first thing I did, I went into work, and I looked into the computer programs, and I found, now it made sense. I could see how the money was being created in the accounting systems. Because I was never educated in accounting. But for, for some reason, whenever I got a job, They'd always give me the accounting system on, this, on the, the, the system, whatever it was. One person said to me, well, no one ever wants that part of it. You know? so they, they always, I always ended up in it. You know? And I went in and I could see, oh, yeah, because we had a piece of the system. Of, it, it was a 40,000 corporate accounts um, every day a trillion or more dollars went through all those accounts. And, and every day the bank was giving overdrafts to many of those corporations. And that was the creation of money. They were making those overdrafts. Then I tried to find out as much as I could about the banks creating money. Somewhere along the line, I found out about the AMI. I don't remember how. Uh, someone sent me a link, whatever. And I read about their 2010 conference, and I needed to go, so I went. And these are some of the people who were talking at the conference. There are many more. Um, wonderful people, wonderful ideas. Uh, it was, I was just mesmerized by it. And I've been going to annual AMI conferences ever since, and doing more. So this is what I've been doing. This is the rest of the talk. I have a local community group that I work with. I give public talks. I, teach, I taught an intro to monetary reform course. I'll talk a little bit about that. But the, the major thing was I taught a course on the lost science of money book. Um, that was an incredible for me, incredible life-changing experience. Not only the content of the book with the people, the, the experience of the people. And then I, um, the last year and a half, I've collaborated to build a website that introduces the basics of the money system to people who don't know anything about it. And then the last thing I've been doing, which I've had a lot of fun with, is I've been reaching out to other reform groups. And I want to talk tonight a little bit about the National Organization of Raw Materials, which I joined this year. And, uh, and I'm trying to get the people in the AMI to understand the connections between the two groups and hopefully help each other. Okay. So my local community group, we've called ourselves the Fed group. That's what came up. Because we when we first started seven years ago, we were studying the Federal Reserve. And it's very important to meet in a group to share ideas, especially these ideas that aren't understood by the general culture, that aren't even in the general culture. So it's very important to have a local group. And you need that support to challenge the assumptions of the society. Um, and uh, it's still going on. Different people have come in and out because people's lives change. But it still goes on. We meet every other week on a Wednesday night. When did you start that? Uh, right after the 2010 conference. A reformer needs the support of a group to talk about ideas, opinions, and feel like a group. 
you're with people. This is to do this work. You need to be connected to people. Always, and, and this is just a suggestion. Always have a topic to discuss. Uh, one person can bring in some information, you know, and it helps sustain the group. Then, over the years, I've given public talks. Uh, I learned. I learned every time I gave a talk. I was learning about how money affected this part of the economy or this piece of history. Uh, and my motivation was the importance of the ordinary system, citizen knowing about this private money system. That was my motivation, how important it was. And this is just Thomas Jefferson. All tyranny, tyranny needs to gain a foothold is for people of good conscience to remain silent. We can't do that. So these are some of the talks. Now, I'm just, I just put this here. That green up on the top is a website that I share with other reformers, not all monetary reformers, but they're all reformers. And if you go there, you'll, you can get the PowerPoints of my talks, I, I, that, and I just tell everybody, use them. You can use whatever materials are there. Uh, some of them are, are recordings of the talk um, with the question and answer period. And, and a lot of the resource materials that I use to prepare the talk, I also put up there. So it's infostation1.net forward slash sue is my portion of it. And there's a thing called talks. And I gave, I mean, I had fun with them. It was like uh, the first, very first talk I gave was to my local Green Party. And I had been a Green Party member, but I wasn't active in the local. And, um, but I thought, oh, I'll call up the local and see, maybe I could talk to them. And it was a wonderful experience. They were so open to me discussing it. And they organized, we, I think we had like 35 people who came. And that was big for our local. And actually, one of the people who came, who wasn't a Green Party member, he came because he was interested in the topic of monetary reform. And he ended up right away joining the Fed group. But those things happen. And um, Occupy Wall Street came along. I gave talks to different parts of Occupy Wall Street. Uh, friends and myself and the people from the Fed Group and other people have gotten together over the years and we did um, talks at the Left Forum. We've given talks on the money system and, and private prisons, uh, the money system and free trade. Uh, Trump, and I just learned. And then one year, I gave a talk to the Northeast Organic Farmers because the farming history of the Farmers Alliance in the 1880s, 1870s and 1880s, is an incredible history that's not known. And these young farmers, none of them knew anything about that, the na that national farm movement. So that, that was very, very fun. I've given a peek. Uh, talk to my local peace action, and even my drumming group. I'm in a group of women African drummers. <laughs> they ended up saying, "So we want you to come and give us a talk." Because you know, I would mention things to them, and they wanted to know about it. So, uh, and and then in 2013, I took a trip uh, with a friend Don, and we went to England, and we visited Positive Money, and uh, that was really good because I discovered it. I was sitting there with. The positive money people, there's like three or four of them in the office that day. And I was mentioning Stephen's book, I said, the history. And I said, well, you know the history, don't you? And they, they hadn't. They hadn't studied the history. And so one of them, Fran, actually was in the, uh, my class for Stephen's book for around six months, and then she got too busy. But she, she was there for six months. Oops. But remember, it has to be fun. You have to really want to do it, you know. Connecting with people is also fun. So I try to put the first thing I tried to do is to put together an intro to the monetary reform course. And these were some of the topics. I don't have the materials up to anywhere. I haven't really spent time doing that. Um, it was a real experiment on my part. 
And it, some, of the, some of the classes worked, and some of them didn't work. I didn't know a lot, and we tried to figure it out together, the class. Um, but it went for 10 sessions. Then, I decided to teach a class on Stephen's incredible book. So after my fourth AMI Chicago conference in 2013, I decided to do that. And I had been a history major in college. And my, of course, my studies that said nothing about the monetary system, right? But I wanted to do this. I, I always loved history. So I would learn by teaching the book. I think I had um, read through the book once, but you, you don't really, there's so much material in there and so much to make you think. Right. So, when we taught the, we taught the class, there were there would be like three or four people would come to my apartment, and then we'd Skype in three or four people, so, and that would be the class. And we met without any interruption every two weeks on a Sunday afternoon from two to five for two and a half years. That's how much it took to get through 24 chapters. Because some of the chapters were so full of information. And I didn't want to like race through it. So we split it up into, you know, a half of the chapter, this session, and then half the next. And I have to say that the, the people who were in, in this class with me are wonderful. They, they loved it. And they just, they just love to think about it and talk about it. And they made, they made this class. They made it. So if you go to that same website, infostation1.net, and you go forward slash books, you'll, you'll get all of the teaching materials. It's all there. I, I made sure from the beginning I wanted to put everything down. And so it's all the chapters. Um, all 24 of them, and the last one was, we just, we took the last class to discuss our experience. And um, please feel free to use this material. It's there for public use. Now, what you find in the material is each chapter has a PowerPoint presentation. I love doing PowerPoints. I love the visuals, right? And in addition, we recorded the class. So as, a, as we went through the PowerPoint, people took turns reading the PowerPoint, and then we'd discuss it, and then we'd go to the next one, and another person would read it, and then we'd discuss it. So that's all recorded. And then, I, since I live in New York, and since I was so into this class, I would go to the New York Public Library to get Stephen's sources and actually read them. So a lot of the sources for the, I, whatever, the books that I got from the library you couldn't take out, they would, they would bring them in from off-site storage. But I could Xerox that, you know, them. Some of them I Xeroxed a lot. <laughs> and, there, and I put that all up here on the material. And all the, as I said, all the materials are there, all available to teach and teach and teach. Whatever you're interested in, I mean, it's the whole history. You can pick different pieces of it that you really are interested in, you know. And I'm available if, to facilitate any learning that you might want. Uh, if you want, I'm um, going to Skype in at a regular time and uh, on day. That's, I, we could organize that, or just use the materials and do it yourself with your friends. Okay. My reasons for teaching the lost science of money. Learning the history of money myself. Hearing the thoughts and feelings of others being the same. And helping myself and others understand how this world works and to spread this hidden truth. And then around, I don't know how this happened. Oh yeah, this is, this is interesting. 
a group of us created a website. So this is the AMI conference of 2015. And AMI invited the Green Party to come. They, they were given discounts. So I think 40% of people in the audience were from the Green Party that, that year. Howie Hawkins gave the keynote speech on the history of third parties, which included parties like the Greenback Party. Because the third parties in the 1800s, a lot of them were very focused on the money issue. That was very up in front of the um, national consciousness. And he's incredible. He, he said to me, uh, he's like a scholar. He works, he works in the warehouse. He's, he's like a scholar. He said to me, his, his vice is, whenever he gets money, he goes and buys a book. He's a voracious reader, but he knows the history of money very well. So at the conference, after his talk, we had a Q&A, and we asked him, Howie, what should we do next? Because there's all these greens, right? And his answer was, create a website to teach people about money and about the Need Act in the Green Party National Plan. But he, he said right away, he said, you have to keep it simple. Because people get very confused very fast. And that's, we always said that to ourselves, you have to keep it simple. So these are the people that did it. Along the way, Howard here helped. He's got some text <laughs> in there. Help us out. And Professor Hoover in Germany was very helpful, reading over uh, the content. Um, and now, the people, we have Kevin in San Antonio. It doesn't look exactly like that, but uh, I like that picture. Will in Norman, Oklahoma. Jean in upstate New York, she's a farmer. Ami in New York City. And Kathy and Steve in Miami, Florida. And we've gotten together for two, now it's getting to be almost three hours, two hours every week at a certain time for the last year and a half and we built this website, Needs for Monetary Reform. And uh, it's, it's focused on the fact that the Green Party has the Need Act in its national platform. It's called Greening the Dollar. But Greens don't really know that it's there. Some Greens do, the ones that help get it into the national platform. But in general, green stuff. So this, this was how can we educate the green in the green party? And um, the website explains the three reforms, the solution, right? Nationalize the Federal Reserve Bank and bank creation of money, and the federal government creates and spends it for people's needs, right? That's the focus of it. Um, and what we've begun to do with this, because it's pretty much, oh, I didn't, I didn't show you. We had the help of our webmaster, Alan, who gave his time and energy. We designed it, but he implemented it. And it gave us a lot of time and energy. Uh, so what, we're going, what we've begun to do is bring it to our local groups, use it as a, 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 a learning experience. We started going to the state parties. I got it into the New York State platform this year. And uh, Kathy and Steve are taking it to the Florida Green Party state platform. Um, I know Howard has been trying to educate the national members, right? Yep. So uh, we keep doing that. <coughs> you know. um, and local candidates. This one thing that uh, I started doing in the election this year is making connections to the, our local candidates and getting together with them and trying to tell them about this, how it can help their campaign. Uh, and even if you're not a Green Party member, you know, uh, please use this for anybody. And then the last thing I want to talk about is what I've been doing the last year is connecting to another group which uh, has um, learning and teaching so intimate, so connected to AMI in the sense that the two groups together in my head explain the, the whole world that we live in. It's sort of, it's sort of like two pieces fitting together. 
This group is the National Organization of Raw Materials, which was begun in the 1930s, uh, a long time ago, too, actually. Now, so what happened was, how I discovered this, about a year ago, my friend Jerry Perry shared a left forum panel with me. We were doing a panel together with some other people. And she included this slide. In 1769, Benjamin Franklin observed that there are only three ways a nation can become wealthy. You can make war, which takes the wealth by force. You can trade, which to be profitable requires cheating. And, or, it can, you can profit through agriculture where by planting a seed creates new wealth as if by magic. So, uh, when I asked my website group about this, what they thought about Ben Franklin's choices, this is what Will, Will said. He said, well, we all know about the wars are in. And about number two, this trade thing, look at the World Trade Center, Center in New York. It's all about cheating. The, the world's traders have built a showcase, a theater, to make us think this is where the wealth comes from. It's the guys working down here on the farm that's creating our wealth, just hard work. We gotta work to create wealth. So I talked to Jerry and I started reading about NORM, the National Organization for Raw Materials. And I have to say, I'm a city girl. I was born, I was born in Brooklyn, raised in New York. <coughs> I do love nature. I've studied permaculture. I love permaculture. Um, but when you live in a city, it's hard to think in terms of, oh, agriculture is really important. Because you don't see it. It's not in your face. Right? But I discovered by the history of Norm, I'm reading their books, that it's very much like the AMI. They have knowledge that is provable, it's not theory, about how an economy works and how money can be distributed as widely as possible to the owners and workers of private enterprise. And their knowledge also has been suppressed by the money power. And, and, the, and the evidence of that is the five million family farmers since 1952 that have been put out of business. And now, some of them, I don't know how many in the past, but I know there's an issue now with suicide farmers now in the United States using their farms. And, it, and that is the work of the money. So again, I ask the question, when I learned all this, well, I haven't, been, why haven't I learned this in my education? So this is a little bit of the, of the ideas of norm. Agriculture must be considered the foundation of the economy of the United States. It is the nation's largest industry, and it creates the biggest share of the raw material input of new wealth in any accounting period. Wild berries feed no one until someone picks them. New wealth is created by the application of human labor to natural resources. Our cities, our industries, and our small businesses would not exist without the work of the farmer. It's, it's, a, I, it's a very hard for me, it's like the money, it's very hard for me to keep this in my head as a city girl, you know? And of course it's not taught, right? How the world works. So one of the concepts of norm is a parity price given to the raw material producer for his product. And what they say is parity prices keep agriculture in balance with the cost of labor and capital in the rest of the economy. So don't, let's not shortchange the farmer. You, what they prove is if you shortchange the raw material producer, and 70% is the farmer. If you shortchange the farmer, by natural law, you will shortchange everybody else in this country. Parity ensures that earned income will be distributed throughout the economy as widely and as fairly as possible. 
So, and these are some of the concepts that they might be hard because they have these words like gross farm income, so it's like you never hear them. <laughs> but gross farm income, you know, the price that we give the farmers for their, for their product, generates earned national income. That's a connection between the farm and the rest of the economy. If earned national income is too low to avoid debt, agricultural prices are below parity. And in 1952 was the last year in this country that parity prices for the farmer was 100% equal to the rest of labor and business. Since then, because of the money power, that parity price has gone down Today it is the farmer is getting 34 percent of what he should be getting to be able to be prosperous in this country, and it's all done through the money power in Washington and the policies that have been implemented since the Eisenhower administration. With parity, gross farm income will multiply as it is spent. Right, the farmer gets his income. He has to spend it. To, to, to do his business. And, and, and as he spends it, it multiplies income in the entire economy seven times. And that's a natural law. And I, I didn't put the proof of it, but you can read their books. And they, they've been, they developed the proof in the 1930s. And one of the founders of the organization went to Congress. And he was, at that point, 1938, 39, he was the most interviewed by congressional committees about this issue, what he had discovered. And they implemented, Congress implemented a parity law from 1942 to 1952 was the last year. So it, it was proof, and that actually proved the parity issue. But of course, they stopped the law because they don't want prosperity in our economy. With parity, earned income will be fairly distributed to owners and workers throughout the private enterprise economy with no debt creation. Because people will have money in their pockets, good money. Right? Uh, the farmer, he takes his income, you know, he has his profit, but he also buys from his rural stores. He purchases tractors and other equipment from the industrial sector. <coughs> And he can pay good work wages. So both the AMI and NORM want a just world where all citizens have the opportunity for a decent life. Both are fighting the money power. And both want to get public US money into the hands of our citizens. So the AMI does it. It creates and distributes new public, the Congress creates and distributes new public US money into the economy for infrastructure, education, health care, what we all need. And Norm is doing it through their parity price, which will distribute the same money as earned income to owners and workers through the private enterprise piece of the economy. So both together, uh, I think, make us stronger. And I'm just going to put this in. Uh, I don't, I don't know how meaningful, because I don't have you know, enough time to go through it. But the other piece that they have of, of how to make the economy prosperous in all sectors is they offer a concept called equitable trade. Okay? Right now we have this free money power trade, right? corporate trade. But they, in, uh, they propose equitable trade. Uh, not the current free cheat, cheating trade. With equitable trade, the goal is that the standard of living of the poorer countries will be encouraged to come up to our standard. Instead of what's happening now, is our standard of living is being brought down to the poverty of the world. Okay. And in their, their equitable trade, the middlemen, the international traders and the bankers, cannot make a profit off the trade. They're not part of this. It takes place between the importers and exporters in each country direct. 
And there's more details to it, but I didn't want to get into it. And uh, this is one of, uh, he wasn't one of the founders, but he was one of the important people who spread the information about Norm, Charles Walters. And he came uh, to this conference for three or four years, actually, uh, before I started coming. Um, and he wrote these two books, both of which I highly recommend. That Unforgiven has more of a historical slant, and uh, Raw Materials Economics is the basics, basic climate. And I, so I asked a lot of questions about, about this, I joined the Jerry a lot. And then I joined Norm as a member uh, at an annual fee. And then they have these conference calls every week. And you can, as a member, you can get on the conference calls. And it's very, I find it delightful. They're, most of them are farmers. So in the middle of talking about, uh, you know, what's going on with uh, Washington, D.C. and the Farm Bill, and, and this and that, they'll suddenly start talking about, I caught a skunk in my trap, you know. <laughs> you know, or, or something about their, you know, the corn crop or something. But I have to say, all of the farmers on these calls have read Stephen's book. They understand the money system better than me. Um, they're, they're, they're incredible. Farmers are not dumb. At least these guys. They, and they know the history. They've gone deep into the history. So here's the end. I hope my experiences will help you ask what, what do you want to do? What, you know? Um, and in the process, you'll help yourself, your family, your community, your country, and have fun because you do it with people. Thank you.